I think I was very lucky to meet Marianne Colvest. She was an extraordinarily generous, rigorous, incredibly energetic, kind, but always making sure that you could do the best that you were able to do. I would think she was confident, yes. Um, a lovely personality. She was v very quick um, in her movements and in her manner. She was incredibly generous with her ideas and her praise, wasn't she? And my, my main memory of her, I'd have to say, was that she was like Speedy Gonzalez. I've never known anyone so fast. She moved fast. She, she moved quickly. She had this incredible vibrancy about yeah. her and, yeah. and energy. Um, and it's like, oh, my goodness me, you know, she zoomed past. She had a real presence. Mm, she was very... Um, striking. Uh, yes, yeah, striking. Very smartly mm. dressed like a... a um, Slim. Yes, and probably probably wearing maramaco fabric, which no one else would have been doing in those days. But she was she she was had her glasses that were the fashion statement. Her her what? Her glasses and her glasses. She, always she loved. She had very bad eyesight, and she always had these wonderful. Ah, oh, Barry Humphreys. Barry Humphreys copied her. Oh, yeah. I think. <laughs> She had these amazing glasses and we all, you know, we'd come in to say, oh, wow, ma'am, look at your glasses. You know, they're fantastic. She was a very warm, embracing person, but she punched along at a, a tremendous pace. Uh, so you were just swept up in that, you know, you just, it didn't ever occur to me not to work very, very hard. <laughs> When I started at Marion, I was very much a novice. I worked in the store, eventually being able to help customers. I think it was one of the best introductions anyone uh, could have had to good design because it, the top designs were there in the showroom. Oh, it was a wonderful experience. Um, you know, I loved working. I, it was never a chore for me to go to work. Marion was always finding out what she might see in you that you hadn't realised and drawing you out. She was very generous like that. So sometimes there was a small design project that I helped with, uh, starting on the letterhead or because I'd been to art school, she thought I could contribute to that. And later doing some painted ap painting applications in one of her clients' houses. I learned a lot about furniture. I learned a lot about design when I was there. And, and, and she was certainly on the cutting edge of, of modern design in Australia. She was very innovative. Everything had happened, particularly in America at first, she, was, she tried to introduce into Australia. We used to refer to uh, Lady Hall Best as ma'am. That was the accepted title. Well, Lady Hall Best's really rather a mouthful. <laughs> And I think it was one of the first girls that was there, I'm sure it was probably Ariane, uh, who's, who came up with this catchy little title, ma'am. <laughs> Much easier. To enter Mary, uh, Marion Best's store, you walked down a beautiful little path off the street and made a right turn into a big room that overlooked the street. Straw matting on the floor, fabulous lengths of fabric, hung to accentuate the furniture. And then you went left and there were more accessories going towards the rear part of the store. Offices were upstairs as well as you walked from the display rooms downstairs to a large gallery space in the front of the store, again, overlooking the street. What, what was exciting about the store was that she used that upstairs floor for exhibitions of artist work who she appreciated. She was very enthusiastic about creating those small exhibits. That was an important space for her. And because she had first with, with so many things, like the Thai silks, the marameco, grass wallpaper. Yes, yes. And that uh, rice and paper lovely, with butterflies in it. The lovely French wallpapers. Yes. And... And lovely French fabric. Yes. There were French fabrics that uh, 
sometimes they were ordered because of uh, samples that we'd been sent, but there was always a rather grand woman that used to come in. She'd hire a hire car and come in and show things. Madame Brenac, I seem to remember. Yes, she used to have the Pierre Frey fabrics. The Jim Thompson silks were a special part of the collection, and she did work with him designing some of the big block checks, the plaids and stripes and complementary solids. I remember that. Uh, she must have also had a lot of other colorways and patterns from the collection. Uh, if she traveled, it was always, you know, part of the travel to look and see what was happening overseas and what was interesting and what could be used in Australia. So we had some uh, beautiful work from England, ceramics from Lucy Ree and Hans Koper. We had uh, Vanini glass and, and uh, then the glass from Finland. And it was always exciting to go and unpack one of the boxes to see what was coming out. Marion and Dora would make a special display of that so people could come and see that. She really loved promoting other people and she was extremely generous in that regard, wasn't she? Yes, I agree with you, but I also think it was her absolute fascination with something being new just as much as it was promoting. I mean, yes. it was like, oh, my goodness, goodness me, look goodness. at this, yes. you know, and, and, and rather than... She was generous, of course, but it also was part of who yes, she was, yes. always having to have the new, the exciting, the innovative. Uh, when the dresses came in, one of my fond memories is of her <laughs> coming down the stairs with a drink in her hand <laughs> and we were all trying on the dresses. And uh, it was one of the rare uh, relaxing times, I think, that I can remember. She was always immaculate, you know, she would arrive at the shop looking immaculate. Mm. Beautifully crisp, Mary Mako dress, face made up, hair beautifully done. Um, and she would come down the grove at <laughs> double quick speed and uh, books under her arm. Mm. And then, boom, into the shop and we'd all be, you know, it was always exciting what was going to happen today, you know. It was, it was never mm. a bore. No, 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 no. Never a bore. Dora Sweet Apple, who was Marion Horbeth's sister, she managed the shop or looked after the shop in Rose Street in the city. As she was a painter herself, she had really strong connections with the art world and various people. Working in the Rose Street store was great fun, and that was Dora Sweet Apple's special purview. She was our boss there and would make sure we were in attendance and learn the learn all about the things we were selling. Rose Street was a trick of place. Um, we carried our own stock and uh, a lot of it was sold in Rose Street from the window. And that was the most extraordinary shape. It was an elongated shape, maybe about five, six feet wide at the front or maybe a tiny bit more, with steps going up to it and the corridor going down, and then it swung round. And right at the back, there was something about twice the size of a telephone booth, um, which was where he used to sort of sit and answer the phone and do all those strange things uh, and come out and attend to anyone that was looking in the window. Dory did the windows always, which were, it was a tiny window, but she would manage to get all our products in there so they were visible from the street. <laughs> uh, we had a lot of art. We had uh, artists like Nolan, like Drysdale, Justin O'Brien, just hanging on a wall where people walked past them. They weren't protected or anything and we would sell them from there. Yes, if someone wanted to buy something that was in the front window, you had to tiptoe through all this <laughs> glass and that sort of thing and get it out and then they'd say, oh, no, I don't think I want it after all and they'd go put it back. But I think it was a, show, a window a showcase for people to go out to Queen Street because Queen Street was out in the suburbs. It was actually a lot of fun and um, we tried to keep everything straight. I do remember if there was an overage 
in the cash register at the end of the day, we were allowed to spend it on cakes, or that was the theory. <laughs> I did all sorts of jobs because I could sew. If we had a run on curtains in the factory, I could go up there and help Claire, who made our curtains, or cushion covers and things like that. I had some jobs. Marion would choose things for a client and I could do the quotes and work with her putting the fabrics together or whatever and then ordering the curtains and couch covers and things like that and seeing that they were installed all properly and she would always double-check everything. Oh, and the chairs. Do you remember the chairs with the, not string, um, cord? Oh, yes. Thin, thinnish black metal little legs. We we used to have to string them. Yes. Yeah, we, did you have to string them? No, they, no. no. I had to string them. So you went across, round and back, round and back. Yeah. The rattan blinds, they would have been sent out to be sprayed and then they came back to the showroom and then um, the tassels were attached and the hooks. So you wound them up and popped them in the the hook with the tassel at the front. Uh, When I was working with Marion, we had a a system where Lady Hall Best always went out with someone who was in charge of the particular job. She'd choose a someone in the staff who was basically called I'd be a, a senior designer to go with her. So you would uh, go and enter the person's house, you would have a look at the house, you'd talk to the client or she would talk to the client. <coughs> um, I would perhaps <coughs> make notes um, and just listen quietly and then we would go back to the office and uh, the whole process would start. Um, when Deirdre Hall Best was there, she was the architect, she would do the floor plans and the layouts. And in my particular case, I was allowed to do the colour schemes. Uh, it had to be vetted by Marion. And I think she probably matched me with particular clients anyway and thought this, she'd suit this person. She would consider and come up with a scheme or the bones of a scheme, I would think. And often, uh, especially later on, when I'd been there quite a few years and there were other people there then, um, it would be, uh, you know, brainstorming. Somebody would say, oh, this would be good. Um, Things would get thrown in. And with a lot of people working on it, you came up quite quickly with wonderful things. You know, something had come in and they'd say, this would be better. (laughs) And so it worked like that. We seem to fly to Melbourne quite often and maybe fit in one or two jobs there a day um, and occasionally to the country. Mm. In Australia, in, in, in the design world, everything had been either yellow or green and rather heavy. And Marion, I think, who was always about innovation, felt that Australia was a country that was hot and that it was warm. It was not green and dark and blue and solid like Europe. So that's why she went for these brilliant sort of oranges and and reds and pinks, more than the blues, I think, and the greens and the cooler colours. She used big swaths of colour. She used colour as the main impression and the main excitement. And it was on the furniture, it was the hanging fabrics, the juxtaposition of the small, bright-coloured pieces that she found in Finland and Italy. And, and, I mean, you know, you would often get remarks by people who'd say, you know, oh, my God, look at the colours they've put together, or, you know, you would never put red and green together and things like that. People used to condemn some of the I stuff we did. remember some, Marion got really upset one day because sometimes it said it looked like she'd thrown spinach on the walls. <laughs> and so these those wonderful dark green walls that she used to do, and especially when they were, ga- when they were glazed because then you'd get the yellow and the green Lovely. coming together and it did look like spinach. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, one thing that I was very impressed with and I remember... Uh, being her chauffeur, that we went into one of the rooms and she explained that the uh, stippling on each of the walls because of the direction of the light had to be slightly different 
to make it all appear the same. And she might have something like a bit of material and she'd say, yeah. I want that colour and, yeah. And the glaze, the final glaze would change the colour if she had some tint in the glaze. Yes. So it might have been a slightly more pinky undercoat with an orangey glaze over it. She actually, OK, if you want to liken her um, colours to music, she managed to have the light and the dark. It wasn't... Uh, it was beautifully balanced and then something she'd throw in and she'd say, and that's F sharp. <laughs> Her family had always had a sort of family house near the beach at Palm Beach and where they all went and it was a very lovely, close family connection. And Marion wanted to do have the same sort of thing but in the snow so that all the family could use it and she could be there and be the sort of doyen house grandmother, you know. And, and so she, with Bill Lucas, created this house, Moonbar, because it was unique in its, its day. After this A-frame, there were several others. Uh, but it appeared in Domus magazine, which was extremely prestigious for for Marion and for the architect Bill Lucas. And she was able to furnish it with all the things, the colours and things that she loved. Simple and uh, affordable and easily maintained. And it worked. And it was really... I always felt it was really her her own little sanctuary. And she loved us going there. It gave her such pleasure right up until the time she died. I always came back and went to see her and told her what fun we'd had and how beautiful it still was and and all those things. Yes, it was we were it was remarkable really. A happy place. It was always a happy, fun place to be. Yeah. I was going to New York and I let Marion know and she said how exciting and how wonderful for you to go and I was going there for four months and she explained, she said to me if you like I'll find I'll ask Noel if you can work there very much because I planned only to go to, for four months and that I would be able to come back and bring my experience there to add to the store and she arranged for me to get what I believe was some form of um, internship there, uh, which was wonderful of her. And I have to confess that I didn't come back. I stayed on in America. Then started to have an idea for opening up a, a, a store of my own and met a friend of mine, Judith Orkenclass, and we decided to do it together as a partnership. We called it Manhattan Ad Hoc Housewares. And it was open from 76 to 86. And in the meantime, we could see the action, of course, in the 70s in Soho and thought it would be a great place to take that idea or some of those ideas to Soho. And so we opened that store in, in 80, late 86. I didn't really realise that I had the creative side, having spent the many years on the accounting side of things. And then... Uh, to my surprise, I finished up teaching interior design. Yes, I uh, was um, made aware of a job in Perth and I felt unsettled in Sydney. So I thought I'd have a change and go over there. So I stayed for 17 years. I think I would have asked uh, ma'am for a reference. It was very nice uh, to have the reference and to, to say, well, I worked for Marianne Best. Uh, she was... Uh, one of the top, or not the most recognised at the time, I think. Mm. I worked there until for about uh, until the end of 1960. In 1983, I opened a shop, uh, which was had my own fabrics, like Marion did, and I I um, had them all made in India. Uh, did a lot of the same sort of things that she did, but didn't have I didn't have the glassware or anything like that. I literally had things that I could 
use and, and sell, but, but people mainly came to me for fabric or to, to design the interiors of their houses or office. I did a, an enormous amount of corporate and commercial work, in actual fact, more than I did domestic. Marion came into my shop when I started. Dee Dee brought her in. And it was just a, probably a year before she died. And she was. She said, oh, this is so wonderful. I had someone else carrying on. It, it might, might not legacy. She didn't use that word. She wouldn't have used that word. But she said something, you're carrying on in the Marion Hall best tradition. And, and that she meant colour there in that, from that yeah. point of view. Yeah. I can't remember her being cross. No. With me. No. And I did a terrible thing. I cut, I was supposed to be measuring some curtains. It's beautiful, beautiful material. And I cut it wrongly because oh. I was having a row with John, I think. <laughs> and I was engaged. And anyway, she wasn't cross. She was very generous. Yes, she was generous in uh, I've in never spirit. worked for anybody else, so I don't know, but to me she was a marvellous boss, mm. just wonderful. I stopped working with Marion about 1961, I think it was, because I was having a child in 61. And um, I must say I felt absolutely lost at that stage without her. <laughs> you know, having the excitement of, of whatever we did, it did each day. I started at such a young age, it became an education. So uh, I'd have been a different person had I not worked there. Well, I think I'd like to say how influential Marion was. I was only there for a year, but I think she influenced my outlook on life and uh, opened my eyes to colour design and, and the interest of always wanting to, uh, you know, know what's happening. She was completely out of her era, in, in, yeah. in fact. Yeah. She, she herself walked into the whole modern age as well as creating it in design, which was, I mean, I can't think of anybody here in Sydney right now that I know. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a different world. It's a faster world. But she, you know, she, she embraced everything that was new she, if she thought it was valuable. And, and I think that was her, her, it was her, I always think of her as being like a whirlwind. Yeah. yeah. But I suppose it was the fact that ma'am had faith in us that we thought we could do, well, we seemed to do things without yes. any On her worry. side, I suppose she was very trusting and also she taught us as well because I didn't have really any decorating training except the few months in the shop in London. You had more than I did. Yeah, yeah but I think I that she liked that because we embraced her ideas, we were taught by her, mm. and uh, what better teacher could we have had? Mm. Marion Best, as I said, was I was really privileged to be there. Um, she was uh, a great character, uh, such a talented lady, and... Um, just didn't miss a trick. Everybody appreciated her enthusiasm, and the enthusiasm included you. You had to be, not had to be, you wanted to be part of that excitement and enthusiasm. And her gaze was so wide. I mean, she was ready to find the most, the new, not because it was new, but to be excited by any number of the arts, music, theater, colour, furniture design. She was in art, of course. She was enthralled by all of that. It, it fed her and, and, and she in turn fed us with it. I think I was very lucky to be part of her world and part of that 